I got a hot spade key. I got a hot spade key. A hot spade key. I got a hot spade key. I got a hot spade key. So we're sitting there at the Global StarCraft 2 League studio in Seoul, watching StarTale Life kick the crap out of Creator Prime, when I got this terrible, cheesy-ass idea for a cheering. Uh, kind of like a sign for the players. Anyway, I made it, and I shamelessly broadcasted to the entire world how lame I was. Turns out, though, the guy sitting behind me worked for Blizzard, and he's like, Dude, I like your cheering. Do you want a Heart of the Swarm beta key? And I'm like, ah, jinja. So needless to say, I was pretty damn happy. But since I'm such a gentleman, I'm going to use my good fortune to your benefit. I'm going to spend the next 12 hours of my life playing nothing but Heart of the Swarm so I can learn everything about all the new units and all the new changes from all three races. Then I'm going to make a super thorough video review so you know everything about Heart of the Swarm before you buy it. So, 12 hour gaming marathon, nothing but Heart of the Swarm. Starting now. BRB. Alright, let's get to work. So we got seven new units, two for Zergs, two for Terran, and three for the Toss. And of course they tweaked a bunch of other things too. Now the Zergs are kind of the stars of the expansion, so they get to go first. Strangely enough, despite the loose consensus that Zerg is overpowered right now, most of the changes came in the form of buffs. A few early tech options come even earlier, and several units got flat out upgraded. But first the new units, and they are sweet. The Infestation Pit doesn't just unlock the Infestor anymore, but the new Swarm Host as well. The Swarm Hosts are but ugly, but what they do is burrow and spawn some decently powerful Locusts, which live for about 15-25 seconds based on upgrades, and they attack ground units with a nice, sort of short, medium range little attack. Kind of just decent DPS. But the thing is, they don't even cost energy. It's just a cooldown. So that means you can plant them in one place and they will continuously spawn Locusts for all of eternity. So that means against smaller armies, you can take out relatively expensive units while not trading anything of your own. And since the Locusts last a decent amount of time, you can keep the pressure on a defensive player without risking any losses, which can be used to force your opponent to attack. My only complaint with these things so far is that they're seriously, seriously butt ugly. Oh my god, look at them. And when they spawn Locusts, they look like someone shoved some chewing gum in a whale's blowhole. I mean, what is that? Like little pink balls? What? They're like goofy little... I don't know. Disgusting. Now here in Korea, they still like Brood War an awful lot, so I don't have to think all the way back to my childhood to remember the Defiler. You remember the Defiler from Brood War? Yeah, the thing that ate other units and shot gas and germs everywhere. Really unsanitary, but the thing was really fun to play with. Anyway, it's back in Heart of the Swarm, but this time, it flies. The Viper, which is the Flying Defiler, has three abilities, two of which are almost identical to his predecessors. First is Consume, which drains health from your buildings, not units, and turns it into energy. Since none of the Viper's abilities have cooldowns, this means that if you manage the ability well, you don't need to spend too much on Vipers, allocating more Overlord desk space to more dps -y units. Second is Blinding Cloud, which makes a small field slightly larger than a fungal growth, and for 14 seconds, everything in the cloud can only attack in melee range. So if you hit a bunch of Marines with it, any of the Grunts not in the front rank can't shoot anything. Pretty sweet. Third, and most fun for sure, is Abduct. The Viper literally sticks out his tongue and grabs a unit, pulling it to its place. Any unit you want, it can be a Colossus, it can be a Siege Tank, anything. That way you can get their capital units gunned down faster than some noob can make a dumb Mortal Kombat reference. Anyways, besides the new units, the Zerg have a lot of other tweaks and upgrades. First off, Burrow can be researched as soon as you have the 100 minerals and gas you need to afford it, which means blocking expansions with Burrow and Lings, or microing injured roaches from the beginning of the game. You can also upgrade Hydralisks to move 25% faster like in Brood War. The Infestor's fungal growth is also different, with a longer range, but no longer being instant. I like this because now you're not really punished if you look away from your marines for a split second and someone brings an infester and happens to nail them with a fungal growth and you lose like 10 marines. If you see an infester, you can move right away. And possibly the craziest upgrade is that now the plus 20 damage ultralists used to do to armored units now apply to every ground unit. That's right, any ground unit in the game that the ultralist can hit takes 35 damage per swing. Damn! Alright, now Terran, more so than the other races, got some of their older units tweaked really hard. Even one of the new units is just one of the old units remixed. First is the Widow Mine, but uh... I, I had a bad experience. I don't really want to talk about the Widow Mine. Uh, 
yeah. So, next up is the Hellbent, which is basically the Hellion when it decides to go all Optimus Prime and turn into a walking robot. Making the switch just requires an armory, and it doesn't change the cost of the Hellion at all. Switching a Hellion to Hellbent mode does a few things. First off, it means more health. It's got 135. And on top of that, it counts as both mechanical and biological, which means both SCVs and medevacs can heal it. Why can medevacs heal a, a, a robot walking thing? I don't know how that works out in Blizzard's head, but it means that you can transition to mech or bio and you'll be capable of healing it with the same tools as the rest of your army. The next big bonus the Hellback gets is damage. It does double the damage. I mean, the range isn't as long, but it also shoots out in the sexy cone shape that eats up lings and zealots like nobody's business. Seriously, 18 base damage, 30 versus light. Like I said before, lots of old units from Terran got majorly reworked. Most of all is the Reaper, where basically everything is different. They don't have a speed upgrade anymore, but now the default speed is much faster than before. They've also got 60 HP up from 50, and they regen health like a madman when out of combat, making repeated harassment pretty damn easy. But their damage got nerfed a bit. They don't have any bonuses versus light units or buildings, so they're not quite so scary as back in their glory days in 2010. Ravens have been buffed a bit, with their Seeker Missile now not requiring an upgrade and taking only 75 energy. Siege tanks are as they were, but unlike Wings of Liberty and both StarCraft games before, Siege Mode, like Seeker Missile, doesn't need to be researched. And that's scary. That's 80 seconds sooner that you can put Siege Pressure on your opponent. Now Thors, with their anti-air splash damage, were pretty good at taking out the little guys like Mulisks and Vikings and whatnot, but they were only pretty good against like the giant massive air capital units like the Brood Wars and the, the Colossi. So now they can switch into this mode where instead of shooting the splash missiles, they have a slower, more hard-hitting attack meant for individual enemy units. But in return, they've lost their strike cannons. Woe is the Lord. Medivacs have a new ability that gives them a boost of speed for a short amount of time. My personal opinion is that this is pretty overpowered, but I might still be shaken up from watching SK Innovation pound Stefano to the ground with lots of drops well. in the GSL code SDL. And when the most successful non-Korean player in the world can't stop these medevac drops as it is, the last thing I think Terrans need is a speed boost to make them even easier. But that's just me. So that's it for Terran. Yeah. Nothing, uh, nothing else new with Terran. Finish them up. Yeah. Yeah. Darren's, Darren's done now. Come on. I just got my key. I didn't know. Medivac comes in, does a drop. I was gonna be a marine, so I got my stalkers, but it was mines. They burrow, I can't see them. They blow up half my probes. Of course, it was my robo to get an observer. It was too late. They blow up all my probes. minutes into the game. I'm mining for one base. <laughs> <laughs> They don't even die when they shoot their payload. It's just a 40 second cooldown. They're scary. They just require a factory, so they force detection early in the game, and are great both offensively and defensively. But man, they've made me paranoid. Next up are my personal favorite, the chunky, warpy, psionic-y Protoss. And most of the upgrades of the Protoss are happening in the air. Before, Toss Air Units didn't do that much good beyond some early harassment, and the last time I had seen a late game Sky Toss was when Squirtle was BMing Nurcio at the GSL World Championship last year in Vegas. He used carriers, and you never use carriers. God, so BM! But anyway, nowadays Sky Toss is a little more viable. First off is the Oracle, and I like to think of it as my personal blue eye of Sauron. Seriously. It's got an ability that grants vision in a big area for a while, and another that gives itself detection for a short period of time. But it can also spend energy to turn on a big ray gun thing that can hit ground units, strong enough to two hit workers and push around any other little guys that can't fight back. It's nice for a two-pronged attack, since hitting a mineral line with an oracle or two is much cheaper and safer than a warp prism drop. Just send it into the main while you're attacked their natural and score some easy kills. The Protoss also got the Tempest, a hulking airship with a strong attack and a giant range of 15, which is too larger than the Siege Tank. 
Now there's been a lot of banter on the forums and on the news about how the Tempest isn't quite balanced yet, so you can expect it to change a little bit before final release. But as it stands, it's great to harass bases if they don't have the air to chase it down, and it gives you the freedom to force engagements. And it has a plus 15 damage bonus against massive air units like Broodlords and whatnot, including the Colossi. So I think it's going to be a pretty solid late game counter. Now the third new toss unit also flies, but it's not from the Stargate. It's actually from the Nexus, and you can build it as soon as you have a Cybernetus Core. It's called the Mothership Core, and it's basically a dwarf mothership. It has a ground attack, a teleport ability that brings it and all nearby units to a Nexus of your choice, an ability that halves the speed of all ground units in an area, and Photon Overcharge, which for 60 seconds makes a nearby Nexus basically the Protoss version of the Planetary Fortress. It gives a Nexus a giant laser that hits for 20 damage with a range of 10. And that's all for 100 minerals and 100 gas. The downside? It's slow. And you can only have one of them at a time. But if later on you want to build a mothership, you can build it straight from the core, and the core's price is marked off the upgrade price. Sweet deal, eh? Oh, and Time Warp is also sweet when you use it with Cyan and Storm from the High Templar. I call it Barbecue of the Core. Besides new units, they've upgraded Phoenixes to have a default range of 5, meaning the slightest bit of micro tears mutalists apart. Void Rays actually got nerfed a bit overall, now only doing their charged bonus damage to armored units. But now to get that bonus, rather than having to shoot something, you just hit a button with a 60 second cooldown. This makes them a little better at small engagements, and it also a little less overpowered when set loose in someone's base or an army that can't fight back. Oh, and for the tricksters out there, sentries no longer need an upgrade to use Hallucination. That makes it easy to scout early on with fake phoenixes, and it's not a huge gamble to try and fool your opponent into thinking you're doing a different build than you are. I love spawning a fake Colossus at the 8 minute mark, and then making it rain dead vikings with my blink stalkers. So that's what's different as far as gameplay. Besides that, Heart of the Swarm puts StarCraft 2 in a pretty sweet new package. The menu is crisp and minimalist, but just as functional. Replays have an added feature that lets you watch them with others and even resume a game from the middle of a replay. This was designed for tournaments where technical problems used to force players to restart, but it gives us nobodies the added advantage of being able to practice our micro and seeing how different decisions would have changed the outcome of things. Most of all, I'm stoked about unranked matchmaking. You can find a game just like it was a ladder match, but with no consequences if you lose. This makes practicing much easier and less stressful, and completely kills the notion of ladder anxiety. So that's it for me. Lots is different, but it's all cool. Each race has new toys and new mechanics to play around with, alongside tweaks and new features that make for a fresher StarCraft 2. The game comes out on March 12th, and if you'll be at the launch party in Irvine, California, I'll see you there. Until then, go forth and kick ass.